Hello, this is Pete from the Make Noise Instagram channel, and way back in 2013, when maths went from looking like this to looking like this, I was beta testing for Make Noise, and while trying out this updated version of maths, I came up with a simplified way to recreate a complicated patch from its original manual. This is a video about the bouncing ball patch. If you're unfamiliar, the bouncing ball patch is a modulation patch which simulates the physics of a ball bouncing. When anything bounces, gravity robs the object of some of its inertia, resulting in less height with each bounce and less time between bounces because of it, ultimately bringing the object to a stop on the ground. The original maths manual had 27 distinct patch tips, demonstrating the many capabilities of this new module. I asked Tony Rolando where these patch ideas came from. What I did was I went and I developed a bunch of my own patches, and then also I went through um, the, the Serge Gold Book, and I found some cool patches in there that I could like adopt to the maths, and then also just went through the uh, Alan Strange book and found some stuff in there that I could kind of adapt. And so it was a combination of, of stuff that I had developed, stuff that came out of the Serge Gold Book, and stuff from Alan, Alan Strange's book. And I kind of tried to pick a selection that felt um, like plentiful, like, hey, look at all these things that you could do with this. There's lots, you know, many pages, but also felt um, not overwhelming, even though I think maybe some of them were actually pretty overwhelming. One of these patch concepts was listed as the bouncing ball. It was distinct from the rest. It lacked an East or a West Coast origin story, it stemmed from the mostly forgotten world of analog computing, and it was the most complicated to set up in the whole manual. This is how it worked. Patch begins, apply the same gate to the channel 1 and channel 4 trigger inputs. This is the original shared system, and it does not have a mult. So in its place, I will be using a stacking cable, connected to the channel 1, and channel four trigger inputs of maths, and I will patch the combined gate output from pressure points into one half of that cable. So now this gate is shared between these two trigger inputs. Set rise fully counterclockwise, fall to three o'clock, scale fully clockwise. This is referring to channel one, so rise fully counterclockwise, fall to three o'clock, scale fully clockwise, like so. Patch the channel one signal out to the channel two signal in. So channel one, signal out, into the channel two signal input. This is being done because on the original maths, both of the outputs from channels one and four were tied to the same attenuverter, their, respect, their channel's respective attenuverter, so that both of the channel one outputs have the strength set by this attenuverter applied to them. In the 2013 version, there are two different outputs. One is a full a unity gain, full strength output, and the other is a variable output with an attenuverter. In this case, both outputs are tied to this value. So by sending one of them into channel two, we can use channel two's attenuverter to scale it differently from the other output which is what we're gonna do now. Set channel two's scale inversion to 10 o'clock. So we're setting it for a negative value and applying the channel two signal out to the channel four both input. So channel two will affect the overall time base of channel four. Set channel four's rise fully counterclockwise. It's fall to noon and its scale inversion control fully clockwise, and engage the cycle switch on channel four. Patch the channel four signal out to the QMMG channel one signal in. Unfortunately, we don't have a QMMG in this system, but what the patch is calling for here with channel one of the QMMG is for it to be set to a VCA. The closest thing we have to a VCA in the original shared system is a Modimix channel. So I'll take channel four's output, patch it to the signal input on one of our mod to mix channels. We were also going to 
patch the other output of channel 1 to the control input of that VCA, like so. And there are some settings for setting the VCA, the QMG VCA. Basically, they are so that with no voltage coming into the CV input, the VCA is uh, off, it's closed. Apply the signal to be bounced to QMG channel 2 signal input. In the original patch, channel 2 is a low pass gate of the QMG. So in its place, we'll be using an Optimix channel. This DPO square wave is a signal I want to hear, but I want to be bounced. I'm patching it into the signal input of my Optimix. We are going to monitor from the output of QMMG channel 2, the low pass gate. And I've patched it into this phonogene, not because we're going to be doing any cool tape effects or anything like that, simply because the input control on the phonogene can knock a modular level signal down to something closer to line level, which is what my recorder wants to see. So apologies to all phonogene fans out there, myself included. We're only using phonogene here for line level conversion. We're going to patch the output of channel one of the QMMG, which in this case is our VCA, to the control input on channel two of the QMMG, which is our low pass gate. We're gonna increase the CV attenuator on our low pass gate. Now, when we press a pressure points pad, we should get a bouncing ball effect. We have some settings here on the bottom to affect the bouncing ball characteristics. The math's very response panel controls will act as a sort of gravity parameter. That's referring to these log to linear to exponential controls on channels one and channel four. This is true on both the original and 2013 versions of maths. They should be set uh, similar, and they kind of are here. And Tony writes, the more logarithmic response will be less gravity. So let's hear what that sounds like. Set these both towards logarithmic. And let's compare that to having them set closer to an exponential side. I asked Tony about his inspiration for the bouncing ball patch. The bouncing ball thing, I think, is, is Eric Archer's, uh, he published an article where he had built an, an old uh, bouncing ball computer, analog computer circuit that was in a, an engineering magazine from back in the 60s or 70s. And he built this and then he, he has a beautiful video of scope shots of it in, act, in action. And I just thought, wow, like maybe this could be applied in some way to music. And then also there's the Apex Twin song, which I had heard, and it's such a cool sound. And I'm, I don't know how Apex Twin did it, maybe with a computer, maybe Apex Twin built some sort of strange analog circuit. And, and so it was just a desire to try to apply those things to the mass. And then I just had this sort of uh, maybe potentially misguided notion that maths is basically a, an analog computer for the modular synthesizer. Pausing here for some context, the original maths manual states, maths builds on the tradition set into motion in the 1960s by Don Buchla, when he adapted circuits found within analog computers common to engineering labs for musical purposes. First of all, I want to start by saying I don't have any proof that that folks like like Don Buchla and, and Serge and, and Dr. Bob Moog were actually um, pulling ideas and concepts and circuits from things like analog computers. My thought was um, those folks all went to college and they studied engineering. And at that time, if you studied engineering, things like this would be in your lab. This is just what they use to teach like differential equations, for example. Uh, whereas today you would use a computer 
in the 50s and 60s, you would use an analog computer. And I, it's, it's really hard for me to not, I mean, maybe somebody could disprove it, but it's, it would be really hard, a really hard thing for me to accept because when I look at something like this, you know, the user interface elements of a Buchla or a Serge especially can all be tied back to something like this. If this, it's just so plain as day to me. So this is, I don't know that this is actual fact. This is just something that I intuited once I started uh, learning a little bit about analog computers. I do feel strongly though that, that it is the case. Fast forwarding to 2013 and Maths has been updated with a new look, replacing the star shape of its pots for vertical columns, updating its graphics a bit, and adding in new functionality too. In particular, a pair of cycle inputs on channels one and four. The revised bouncing ball patch utilizes these cycle inputs to streamline the whole process and make it faster to set up. The 2013 version of the bouncing ball patch is quite a bit shorter. It begins, set channel one's rise fully counterclockwise, fall to three o'clock, and response to linear. Set channel four's rise fully counterclockwise, fall to 11 o'clock, and response also to linear. Patch the channel one end of rise gate output to the channel four cycle input. This is eliminating the entire QMMG VCA section, the QMMG channel one section from the original bouncing ball patch with a single cable. Next, patch the channel one variable output to the channel four fall input. Channel one, variable out, to channel four, fall input. This is eliminating the maths channel two section from the original bouncing ball patch. It doesn't say in the patch here, but what you wanna do is set the scale for channel one in a positive direction for traditional gravity. You can set it negative for inverted gravity, if you like. Patch the channel four output to a VCA or low pass gate control input. You can send this to any modulation destination of your choice. I will be patching it to the signal input of QPOS. I have QPOS's resonance control fully clockwise, which will turn it into a kind of pingable percussion source. Finally, patch a gate or trigger source, such as the gate output from pressure points, I'll be using zero control, to the channel one trigger input of maths for a manual start of bounces. Manual gate output. To the trigger input of channel one. The 2013 version of the bouncing ball patch is one, two, three cables. Now that we have the basics of the bouncing ball patch in place, here are a couple of ideas as to where we can take it further. A moment ago, I used the terms traditional and inverted gravity. These are made up terms, but the idea is with traditional gravity, as an object falls, it bounces more frequently. Inverting this would mean it begins with its most frequent bounces, and as time goes on, these bounces become less frequent. To do that in the bouncing ball patch, start by increasing the fall amount on channel four, and set the channel one attenuverter to a negative direction. Now, when we press a pad, the object will bounce most quickly and then slow its bounces down. Another idea is to take one of these modulation outputs that we're not using and incorporate it into our patch. I will take the channel one unity output and I'll patch it to the frequency one control on QPOS. Now the frequency of our bouncing ball will be modulated in tandem with the rate of its bouncing.
Can we set up a bouncing ball patch on an oak coast? Yes. Patch the slope CV output to the dynamic CV input. This will allow the slope section to control the dynamic section. Next, we'll want to modulate the rate of slope, and we'll use contour to do that. Patch contours CV out to the right input of voltage math, and then take either of the voltage math outputs and patch it to the time CV input on slope. In the cases of both slope and contour, we're gonna want a decay style envelope. On contour, that means setting onset and sustain fully counterclockwise, and decay around four o'clock. Decay will set the length of modulation. On slope, we're gonna set rise fully counterclockwise and fall, I'll also put around four o'clock. This will set the slowest bounce time. And then over here in voltage maths, I'll set the attenuator around 2.30, 3 o'clock. This will set the range of change between the slowest and fastest bounces. You can experiment with any of these. Next, I'll patch a manual gate output. I'm taking that from zero control, but if you have a pressure points or something, that would work too. To the gate input on contour, so now, when I engage cycling on slope, every time I press a pad on the zero control, we'll get a bouncing ball style modulation effect. Let's take a listen. A couple ideas as to where to take this next. The first would be to change the pitch of our oscillator. So I'll patch the pitch row from our zero control into the volt per octave input on our oscillator. And I'm also going to remove the manual gate from the zero control, and instead I'll take the clock output from the zero control and patch it to the gate input of contour. But I'm also, and this is a, this is a bonus tip, going to use a stacking cable if you have a mult, that would work too. And I'm going to send this clock output to both the gate input of contour and the trigger input on slope. This way, it's guaranteed when contour is gated, slope will be reset as well. So they'll begin at the same time. Let's give this a listen. recent music recommendations that use the bouncing ball effect. More recently, the group Second Woman, the first track off their first record, I feel strongly that there's some bouncing ball uh, techniques being used. You, you, you'll hear it about midway through the track, you'll start to hear it. Uh, it's, a, it's maybe a little more musically applied than the Aphex Twin track, which um, the Aphex Twin track is incredible, but also feels almost like an auditory exercise. Uh, it's very fun to listen to, but it, it doesn't really get the groove going. The, whereas the second woman track, it gets a groove going and it, it's a great track. And then midway through you start, it starts getting into this, this bouncing ball swing that, that works really well. So given its history of being a complicated patch and one that does not play nicely with the grid, I had to know if Tony was surprised to see the bouncing ball find a life as a kind of cult patch. Definitely surprised that it caught on because it is kind of a complicated patch, especially the original version. Now the, the, the version that, that you came up with, Pete, which makes use of the cycle input that we later added the maths is much more streamlined and way more approachable. The original version is kind of ridiculous how much cabling and, and modules you have to use to get it going. So definitely surprising that it caught on. Um, but I think maybe the reason, I mean, the reason that it sort of fascinated me initially ties into a lot of what is fascinating about modular synthesizers in general when you first approach them. And that is the way that they can have, I would call it aleatoric, they can create aleatoric music, music that you're, you're programming, but you're not necessarily performing you're sort of setting up a program using the patch cables 
for a series of events and, and processes that are going to just play on their own, almost like in the way that nature just carries on, you know, storms move in, storms move out, snow falls, snow melts into water, water flows down into the river. It just, it's like this continuous process that you could literally leave running for as long as there was power to power the system. And so I think things like that are really fascinating when you first approach modular, just because not very many other instruments have those capabilities in such a, I mean, they, they have them. I mean, there was this amazing uh, contest they used to do uh, back in the late eighties, early nineties with, with, with the Kurzweil since the K2000, K2500, where the idea was to create an entire piece of music where someone would just hold down one key and all these things would happen. And it couldn't be sequenced. That was the whole thing. It wasn't just supposed to be like a sequence. That's easy. This was using all of the essentially analog computing functions and modulation sources and destinations that the K series had. Um, there's a whole, a, a lot of the same functions that you would have in an analog computer or maths are all in the Kurzweil K2000, the vast operating system, you know, add, subtract, or all that stuff's in there. And so the idea was you'd hold one key and music would happen. And, and so I think, so, but that is very, that's not super common, obviously. That's, a, that's kind of a unique thing. And, but for modular, that is one of the main purposes. So when you first approach a modular and you see this capability, it's really fascinating. And I think the bouncing ball is, is 100% that. It's this strange thing that you can program in and it just has a life of its own. It just keeps bouncing along and feeling very natural and organic. It's not on a grid like a drum machine would be. Um, it's, it feels like you're watching the physics of electricity or listening to the physics of electricity occur in real time in front of you. And you, you, know, you nudge a potentiometer and the whole thing changes. It responds to that. So I think that's really what gets people locked into it. Even if they can't use it musically, it's still a wonderful sound experiment that could, that potentially triggers other musical, more musical uh, creative impulses later. Maybe not even in that particular session where you were playing around with it, but later, as is clearly the case with musicians like, uh, like Second Woman, I mean, they, they had to have at least seen this somewhere and it must have you know triggered some thought in their mind of like how to apply that musically. That's the bouncing ball. If you have a Mats, I encourage you to try it out. It's not only a fun patch, but it's also a nice way to think about the module as a system of functionality rather than four individual channels. If you post something with it to Instagram, use the hashtag bouncingballpatch. I'll be keeping an eye out and I'll be happy to share any of those posts in our stories. Thanks and happy patching.